Welcome back to the video series on the InnoSource contributor role. In this section, we will go into some more detail into the mechanics of making a contribution. What are the steps towards a successful contribution? Well, actually, there are three phases. The first one being opportunity acquisition and uh, preparation. The second one is actually then crafting the code. And the third one is actually to polish and wrap and present your contribution. So what are the differences when working on an inner source project compared to your home team? In your home team, you already know all of the participants. You know how you communicate, you know how you interact, and you know which kinds of patterns you use when coding. When going to an inner source project, that changes a little bit. So you need to plan ahead and make room and space to get accustomed to that new project. So how do you, how do, you do that? First, uh, start, start, try to start early. Because if you do that, then you'll have the contribution ready when you need it. And second, as you work with the host team, you'll get, in a, uh, get a feeling of how the lead time will evolve. And once you continue to work more with the host team and contribute more, you'll also see that this lead time will drop. What's another difference? When working in your home team, you already know which kinds of um, reaction times to expect. When you send a pull request to the worker that's sitting at the desk next to you, you know when roughly this person will respond. Same is true when you're collaborating with someone on your team that's, who sits in a different time zone. All of those implicit rules, they are not quite as visible when you join a new team. So whenever you feel kind of something strange is going on when making your contributions, make it explicit what your expectation is but also ask the team which kind of reaction time you can expect so that you do not become grumpy because someone's not answering you. Oh, it's a real problem. Now, how do you handle that? Just for example, in an issue ticket, write a note, yeah, I'm going to definitely handle this, but I can't do this right now. I'll have more time in three days, if you have more time in three days. So with all that focus on written communications in inner source, does that mean that there's no space for face-to-face -face communication? Clearly not. Comparing face-to-face -face communication to written communication, in face-to-face -face communication, you have way more bandwidth. You see the person, you see what they're doing with their hands, you hear which kind of tone of voice they're using. In turn, when you're using written communication, the advantage is that all of the things that you want to communicate ends up in an archive where someone else following your path can read it up. So try to make a, a balance here to handle personal issues and to handle um, kind of conflicts in person, but also track important decisions in written form. Now you've agreed with the host team on what you want to do and somehow how you want to do it. Um, so now you're, and you're going to start. So what differences await you now? First, you'll be in less contact with the host team. And second, they will actually, expect you to not to be less familiar with the code and ex don't expect you to be as knowledgeable as their own team full-time engineer. Uh, but as Isabel said, you'll be treated more like a new team member and they will be happy to mentor you actually. Aside from mentorship, do you always have to wait until your trusted committer friends are waking up? Well, because there is such a focus on written communication, there is a track record of um, decisions made and of uh, other explanations that are available in writing, such that usually when you hit an issue, you can unblock yourself by digging deeper into the documentation, but also digging deeper into the communication trail. Right, So, but what does happen if you didn't manage to unblock yourself because that small glitch definitely just had no documentation or whatever or communication track at all? Why not just go over to the trusted committer who might actually just sit rather close to you? Well, you can actually do that, uh, but then you might only receive a solution that works for you, right, locally, and the solution will go off record and will be lost for other people who might have the same problem later on. So what can you do better? You can try and go into the public communication channels of your inner source project and try to contact the trusted committer there, because then your conversation and the solution it might contain and the problem as well, go on record and are available for usage as Isabel just mentioned. Okay, so you found a way out of your um, dead end 
and someone gave you the solution. What do you do with that? Well, you add it to the documentation. Make your first contribution be a documentation change. And with that, build up kind of your first reputation within the host project. Now you've crafted a great contribution and you've added a nice piece of um, documentation to it and circumvented all these sorts of small and large glitches with the help of the community. Now, how do you make sure that your contribution actually gets merged easy and uh, quick? Well, it all revolves around the motive of enabling the trusted committer to focus on non-automatable uh, parts of that task. That might be algorithmic questions or cases of regressions. How this is actually handled is two steps. The, for the first part is local uh, validation scripts, so-called pre-submit scripts. They often do things around uh, code uh, styling and automated unit tests and all that sort of stuff. And I would definitely recommend you to use them before actually committing something. And the second part being continuous integration and everything that is automated in the project uh, repository itself and that might check things beyond a local unit tests and actually going into integration tests. So we've shared with you a couple of these things that you have to keep in mind when making your first contribution. If you want to dive deeper, I would like to invite you to read the articles that are accompanying these videos. However, above and beyond all, what I would like to do is to invite you to make your first pull request. Don't wait until it's polished and totally fine. Um, there's nobody who's perfect. Instead, trusted committers expect you to be a new team member and they expect to spend some time mentoring you through the process. And they also expect to help you out to polish and to improve your contribution. Right, what Isabel just described is calling working in the open and it's a very important part of the inner source experience. Doing as Isabel just explained enables you to get early feedback and to act and receive the mentoring you need when you need it. And additionally, it actually enables the trusted committer and sort of nudges them to actually provide good reviews for your pull requests and not to just expect a not it through and the least possible amount of time per request, which will actually be beneficial for the quality. So with that, you know all of the mechanics that you need in order to make your first contribution. In our next video segment, we will go deeper into what the benefits of making a contribution are and give you the arguments to convince your team members to give you time to make your first inner source contributions.